Good morning. My name is Edmund Hildo Santiago and good morning from the United States and uh, good evening or good night for those of you who are joining us in China. My name again is Edmund Hildo Santiago. I am a Vice President of Client Relations at University Consultants of America. Welcome to this um, to our topic today, the unique opportunities of American colleges and universities. Uh, this is as a part of a series of webinars that we're doing to support families during this time um, that we're living uh, in these challenging times. So we're uh, providing you with some value added information today. The focus today again is the unique opportunities of American colleges and universities. And just to tell you a little bit more about myself um, before we kind of get into the content piece. My background is mostly in education. I did attend Yale University and I also attended Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. There I studied policy and management. I have a business uh, certificate from un the University of California, Berkeley, Haas School of Business. And again, a lot of my experience has been in the education space working with uh, high schools, uh, middle schools, as well as in higher education, um, in systems reform, research, public schooling. So I have a lot of information, information background and experiences that really lean, lend themselves to uh, talking about these topics. And now at my work at UCA, it's been a very robust experience working with students um, and working on various aspects of our work. So today we're going to be going over the topic of the opportunities of the American college system. The American college system is different in many ways from a lot of systems in other countries. So as an overview, we're going to talk about a little bit more of the variety of colleges in the United States, academic structures, uh, environmental factors uh, at different colleges and universities, also issues of student culture and how important and how that impacts sort of the experience that students have at a college and university. And then sort of the outcome piece, which is the internships and the job opportunities during and after um, the college experience in America. So kind of putting this all together and really formulating some takeaways and some strategies that you can all uh, take home and uh, really think about as you move forward in this long process. So when you think about uh, American colleges and universities, you usually think about the usual contenders, first of all, who comes to mind, probably the Stanford's of the world, Harvard, MIT, Princeton, Yale, Duke, Columbia, Penn, Chicago, uh, Johns Hopkins, and Northwestern. So these are the top schools, technically, according to some rankings that exist out there. Uh, rankings can be useful, but they also don't tell us the full picture. So uh, we want you to think a little bit outside of the box. These are obviously quality schools, great schools. I attended some of these schools. Um, but there are many, many other options in the American landscape of higher education that are of high quality and um, provide different types of experiences for students. So did you know, let's let's talk a little bit about maybe numbers and facts. Did you know that the US has thousands of non not for profit uh, schools, and that there are about 399 national universities, 605 regional universities and 223 small liberal arts colleges. So these are different listings that the US News and World Report has. So these are numbers that of, of the colleges that participate in the US News and World Report rankings. There are obviously other colleges and universities that may not participate or participate informally from part of those rankings or not. So this is giving you a snapshot of the amount of, of colleges and universities that do exist um, within the American educational landscape. So out of all of those schools, we recommend, we have vetted, we have looked at, researched, and we recommend over 300 of these schools. And this is really highly dependent on the needs of the students at the time that they apply um, to school. So this depends on the student's needs, what that fit is for that student, and um, you take it from there. 
so the, what does this mean for you? This means that there is a wider range of curricular act structures within colleges and universities. There's also a wider range of experiences that you can have and partake in at different colleges um, and universities. And then it also means that you need to think about finding a good fit for you as a student or parents or families as you think about these colleges and universities, a good fit for your student, where they're gonna be happy, where they're gonna thrive and have good outcomes. And then there's also cost opportunities. Different colleges and universities have different price points as well. So thinking of that about that, how does that sort of affect the way that you see different colleges and universities and the opportunities that they provide you with? One aspect of the college experience that can be different in the US are the calendars in that system. So there's not one calendar, there's not one size fits all. As you can see from these examples, there are semesters, there are trimesters, there are um, quarters as well. There's 411, there's, there's uh, 414. Um, so there are other systems of calendars that do exist uh, out there. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you are aware of that because that can kind of determine what your year is going to look like. If you're taking shorter classes because there are more, uh, there's a quarter system, then your classes will probably be shorter, probably more intense, maybe you'll take less within that quarter or not, versus taking, you know, being in a semester system where you might have to take four or four, four, four or five classes a, um, a semester, for example, that's what happened at, when I attended Yale. So takeaway here is that academic calendars are different and they can impact your experience. The course offerings also differ at colleges and universities. Obviously, different colleges and universities offer different majors and offer different um, courses. Some offer a lot of science, social science courses, some offer much, many more social, many more science courses or math courses, but overall uh, colleges and universities um, cover the range of majors within their course offerings. Uh, for example, at Yale we had a blue book which was the course catalog and it was really thick, so there were a lot of robust offerings. Um, through that blue book and many colleges and universities have course catalogs that you can look through and understand what those offerings are. You can also take courses at the graduate school. There might be some prerequisites or you might test into some graduate school courses or they, they might uh, want you to write an essay to see whether you should be a good fit for taking graduate level class. But that opportunity of taking graduate school courses is open to students. At some colleges and universities, such as colleges in, in Boston, Boston Consortium, you can cross-register at different colleges. So for example, you can be a student at Tufts University. However, you can take a class maybe, for example, at BU, if that class is not available at Tufts. Then there are also dual degree programs. And with those dual degree programs, you can probably do a, a bachelor's degree and then do an MBA and then, or do a bachelor's degree and do an MPH, a master's in public health, or, or even there are programs that do sort of the BA or BS MD degree program. So being aware of that helps you to understand where you can potentially fit in within those colleges and universities given their offerings. Another aspect that changes from colleges, from one college to another, um, are the experiences that they offer. Here's sort of a, a snapshot of some things that may be offered. City semester, for example, you can go to NYU. You can be a student at NYU and maybe do a semester in LA. So you have take, kind of had that experience of living in two cities, one being New York City and then another city being Los Angeles. So that's an example of a city semester. I had a friend who did a semester at C. She was not a science major. Many people think that semester at C is probably more for ecology or science majors. She was an arts major and she went to different cities as a part of this semester at C, had classroom, had classes 
literally on a boat in the ocean or at different ports. And it was a great experience. She grew a lot as a person and um, made a lot of determinations about her life as a result of that semester at sea. More common in the American landscape is the study abroad opportunities. One friend of mine did Yale in London. So Yale has a campus in London and you can take classes at that campus. Conversely, uh, NYU has many study abroad programs that you can kind of uh, opt into. You can take courses in Milan, you can take them in Italy, France, Spain, all over. And so that's another viable option. Northeastern is known for experiential learning and co-op learning, and that's basically um, you doing more to more applied learning um, within a job setting. So you're learning coursework, but then you're applying that coursework in a, in a setting, in a job in Boston, for example, or during the summer at a job, um, at a job in another city. For example, I had a friend who did that and was able to get a summer internship at Boeing um, in Seattle. So from Boston to Seattle, these are the opportunities, the experiences that you can have. Academic curriculum can also differ from college to college, universities. What is required is basically what the curriculum kind of states. Here are some examples. Some schools are very open with their curriculum. They want you to take advantage of as many different courses and they don't really tell you what courses to do. They leave it up to the student. There may be some uh, distributional requirements or not, but it's pretty open. Uh, for example, at Brown, they want students to make the most of all those resources. So they, they give students the freedom to learn. Conversely, at Columbia and uh, University of Chicago, they have what is called the core curriculum, and those are preset courses that all students have to uh, participate in, and it's sort of part of that Columbia University experience or that Chicago experience. So if, a if you meet another student at Chicago, you will have had similar classes or the same classes as part of those requirements, and you will know what that experience is about. At Yale, we had distributional requirements, much more of a general education. So we had to take requirements from four distributional groups, math and science, language arts, um, social sciences, and then the arts um, and humanities, um, for example. Many students, as they go, um, through this process, you know, it, it can be stressful. And so they stress out about what if uh, I want to major in this? What if I want to major in that? And that's going to determine this or that. And they kind of get stressed out about declaring a major. So in some cases, you do have to declare a major at some colleges and universities before you arrive. In some cases, they just want to know on the application what you're thinking of majoring in so that they know numerically what students are thinking about. They don't, that doesn't necessarily put you in that specific major, although it can sometimes. So it's better to understand how that college or university works. In other cases, after the first year, you have to declare a major or after the second year. At Yale, you could declare a major after your first or second year, most likely the second you had to, absolutely. Um, another example is pre-med. A lot of people may want to be pre-med in college. You don't have to major in pre-med. Some colleges don't have pre-med majors. So uh, if you're doing pre-med, you have to know that you're doing those pre-med requirements prior to um, or during, you know, at a, at a certain point so that you can plan specifically. I had a friend who was a Spanish major and she was pre-med and she was able to um, do all her, her requirements um, during her four years, but declared her Spanish major during the second year, and then she went on to Harvard Medical School. So there are many viable options in terms of, you know, declaring a major. Other than academics, there's also the variable of environments. There are different environments in the U.S. school system. Not all schools are the same. So if you see here, there are two examples. 
One is of uh, UC Berkeley, it's a large sprawling campus. Um, the other one is a Stanford. They're in similar areas, Bay Area, um, but Stanford is smaller, about 7,000 students, six or 7,000 students, whereas Berkeley has 30,000 students. So that's another variable to think about as you plan your college process. Being a student at a 6,000 or 7,000 student school will be very different than being a student at a 30,000 student school. So take that into account um, as it will expect, it will impact what type of experience you have. Obviously, the quality um, would not be an issue with these schools. It would just be the type of experiences and also maybe the diversity in the student body that exists and the amount of people that you'll be interacting with on a daily basis. Another aspect of environments um, within college systems are that all of these colleges are not in the same type of environment. So we already visited with two examples. Here are a couple more examples. You can see sort of from uh, left to right, Boston University is in the city of Boston. Princeton is a little bit much more of a college town outside of uh, the capital of New Jersey. And then I believe this is USC. It's in LA, but it's sort of a little bit of an urban oasis within, within LA, um, part of LA, but sort of has its own campus slightly in the grid, but not absolutely in the grid of the city. And then Pomona College in California has its own little campus, sort of a little bit more suburban. Um, so those are different types of college environments, college experiences that will obviously impact how you feel, what you experience at a college and university. So take that into account as well, because that's part of the uniqueness of the college experience in the American landscape of higher education. Many people underestimate sort of the impact of culture. So culture, culture is really the habits or the things that people do on those college campuses, right? Um, if you do not like football, then you may not want to go to the University of Michigan since a lot of cultural events are around sort of that football theme. Um, and going to football games, parties around football games, uh, charity events around football games. So it may determine a lot of things about the culture at the school. So if you're not really gun ho or really, you know, excited about football, or then you may want to rethink where you're going. Other schools have more, much more of a participation in a Greek system that is fraternities and sororities. Um, and you know, some examples of that would be sort of a University of Florida is a large school, a very large school. So um, I've heard from some examples of students that if uh, you're in part of sorority or fraternity there, you might feel like a fish out of water or it may take you some more time to find friends. Uh, another example is USC. They also have a fraternity scene, a sorority scene there. So a lot of parties and events do kind of, re of um, revolve around that or sort of cultural piece. There are other things that are quirky about culture, such as at Yale, there are secret societies. Um, there are, you know, the student body at MIT, for example, here are known for their pranks. And here you can see sort of a, a fire truck, I believe, on top of one of the buildings there. So they're very intense at MIT, but they also are pranksters. So that's part of the culture. And, and you need to know that in order to be able to say, do I fit in here? Will I be happy there? Do those things uh, make me excited about going to that school? So culture is definitely important in terms of uh, how you feel at a school. So now we're gonna talk about a little bit more about the outcomes piece. So some of the outcomes here are the, you know, what's going to be happening during your college experience in terms of internships or job opportunities, after the college experience, how does that happen? Uh, you obviously go to college for the outcome of um, not only becoming a better citizen or becoming more globally minded, which is a lot of the American um, sort of schooling system mentality, 
but also to get a job, right, to have those outcomes. So Northeastern is a school that is known for their co-ops, and as I mentioned, and I've had friends who um, actually, uh, you know, participate or went to school at Northeastern and then got jobs at Boeing as a result of being an engineering major, they're having internships in Boston and then having internships in Seattle. Another way of obtaining jobs, and this is seen a lot in the Ivy League, um, is the Alumni Association. Having a strong Alumni Association of people who really believe in the college experience that they had, have a sense of community around you know, what it means to go to Harvard and what that means to them. And there's this intimate relationship with what that college experience was like. So a lot of job opportunities and internships happen sort of formally and informally by recruiting on campus uh, through Harvard, uh, through the Harvard Alumni Association with career services. Another aspect is sort of uh, this aspect of location, location, location in terms of internships and opportunities. So the University of Washington, as we can see here, um, is in Seattle, Washington. As a result, University of Washington is a great school, larger school, public system, um, but Microsoft is also in Seattle, Starbucks is in Seattle. So there's a lot of different opportunities that align with the University of Washington and the University of Washington becomes a funnel to jobs because of its proximity and its relationships with Microsoft and other companies um, that are in the area. So that's, um, sort of what we can sort of expect in terms of the connection of job opportunities and internships uh, during and after the college experience in the U.S. So overall, you really want to, um, you want to have a good time when you go to college, right? You want it to be a positive experience. You want it to be uh, a strong academic experience. But as we can see, there there's a lot of quality schools. But the experience in the U.S. educational system is not only about the academics, but it's also about the environment. It's also about the social aspects. So there's a lot of sports, music, fun, travel, all of these things that are part and integral of that four year experience. So do not neglect to um, really look at those aspects of whatever college and university you're looking at. So what are some of the takeaways that we can learn today? Some strategies here. Um, we know that there's a top 10 or a top 20 schools and many schools have Harvard on their mind or Stanford on their mind or Berkeley on their mind. However, we don't want you to limit yourself to top name schools only. We want you to keep an open mind. So be open to the schools that nobody knows. Be open to the University of Washington, which you may know of or may not know of, but may not have a deep knowledge of, or be open to the University of the Redlands, or be open to Swarthmore, Williams, Amherst, other colleges and universities uh, that exist on the North, in the Northeast, the Midwest, and in the West in the United States. Another aspect or another strategy that's important is researching intelligently. Don't go just by what other people tell you. Do not go only by rankings but look at the schools, look at what they offer, how they offer it, when they offer it, what the student experience is, and then um, make some determinations from there. As we can see today, and we can really understand and we can um, appreciate, is that academic experiences are different from one school to another. Columbia's experience academically is not the same as the University of Chicago is not the same as going to Yale, is not the same going to uh, the University of Florida or the University of Missouri or Purdue as some examples. And all of that to say is that you need to know where you fit in, right? Like where do you fit in um, in terms of your interests, in terms of your academic profile, in terms of um, where you see yourself, where you can live location-wise, because at the end of the day, you need to choose a place where you're going to be happy. And this is sort of the, the openness of the American educational system and also the uniqueness of it, because you can find something that will fit you and that you don't have to only do this specific school or that specific school 
um, because there is a multitude of quality. There's a multitude of experiences and it's better to have more options at the end of the day. Think about schools that maybe reach schools for you or target schools, schools that you can get into. And then also other schools that you know that you will get into. And at the end of the day, this is all about the last point here, which is the admissions process is really about collecting options. We want to collect as many viable options for students so that they have um, many choices and opportunities and they can make the best choice for themselves at the end of the day. So that's the end of this portion of this content for the unique opportunities of American colleges and universities. So next week, we will be discussing another very important topic, which is about the personal statements, some myths, some truths, and some strategies around those personal statements. So thank you very much for tuning in this week. We'll see you next week. Thank you very much for your time, and we hope that this was of great value and will help you make decisions in the future. Take care.